was the night before Christmas, whilst I watched Liam snored, I dressed up as a ghost to discuss Star-Lord. Liam, wake up. Michael, is that you? Dressed like this? Yeah. Got a fucking problem with it? Jesus. Fucking... Do you want to... Do you want to fucking go? Alright, just get your Crocs on. Let's go. It's amazing how less than 10 years ago, no one really knew who Peter Quill, Star-Lord, or any of the Guardians of the Galaxy were. James Gunn helped to redefine the Guardians and make them a household name. Both Guardians of the Galaxy films have met with critical and financial praise, and that's down to the actors and writing. So if I were to ask you what were some of Peter Quill's character traits, you would say... Light-hearted, cocky, self-assured, spontaneous, very emotionally driven. And I'd be with you on that description. It's clear that underneath that hard exterior, he is the most human out of the group. Sure, he may not be perfect and acts immature or like a complete a-hole sometimes, but it's clear he does care about his friends and other people around him. He's a fun character. So then why does his character in Infinity War and Endgame feel like a completely different character? In my opinion, the Russos did a great job in the story, and for the most characters. However, their handling of Star-Lord in Infinity War and Endgame did hurt the character and his arc. That's a bold claim. Care to explain? Gladly. <laughs> Alright mate, ghost Christmas present innit? No, you're, you're just wearing a different coat. Okay, I'm trying to di diversify our content, is that, is that what you want to hear? Let's start chronologically, and I'll prove to you that Star-Lord is not the same character. Time has passed since the second Guardian of the Galaxy film, and the Guardian team seems much closer, much more relaxed with each other, but some narrative threads from the second one doesn't continue over to Infinity War. What are you talking about? Mantis is there, Groot is no longer a baby. Yes, but it seems the growth of the Star-Lord's character hasn't changed. Ego crushed his Walkman, and seemingly all the songs that went with it, Kragling presented him with a Zoom and with it a chance for seemingly newish music, maybe something from the mid-90s or 2000s. Whilst I'm not James Gunn, I felt the crushing of the Walkman symbolised his character looking forward to the future instead of looking to the past, and maybe a chance for him to grow with his new team, the Guardians. Having said that, do you know what songs they played when answering a distress call in Infinity War? What about Tony and Nebula when they're trying to fix a Benatar in Endgame? What? Rubber Band Man by The Spinners, released in 1976, and Dear Mr. Fancy, released by Traffic in 1969. It's not completely unheard of to have 60s and 70s music on a device, but my Spotify playlist is nothing but pasty Klein. We need a call of your playlist, but I hear what you're saying. Why not just make it more evident and more clearer by having music not from that era? Guardians 1 and 2 are about retrospective, encapsulating the loss of his mother in the first one, and his death of his daddy in the second. This should have been the turning point for Quill. And that turning point is the music. We are still living in the past when we should be looking to the future. I'm not saying we should have Kanye West music playing over the sequence, but something seemingly not from that time period would have made more sense. Now you come to mention it, didn't Ego also destroy Star-Lord's helmet? I suppose it's feasible that he either repaired it or got a new one, but you would hope that this would be an opportunity to change. With the helmet being broken into pieces, you'd either ditch the helmet altogether to show you've moved on, or change as a person, or you'd get a new helmet. Maybe one bearing resemblance to the comic accurate helmet? I don't know. What you've described just sounds like nip. Oh, don't you worry. That was a practice question. The real exam is about to take place. Okay, class. You've just rescued four from the destruction of this ship. How do you react to an unconscious man? Do you A. Comfort him? B. Just stand there and listen to this man's story? Or C. Turn your insecurities into a competition that may be funny in the first viewing, but seemingly comes across as not only forced humour, but it may be a bit insensitive, comparing family losses and tragedies to seemingly be the person who has lost the most in your friend's eye to somehow appear better. Yes. Question. Yes. 
Well, in the movie, it's clearly shown that Peter is insecure. With Thor placing his hand on Gamora's shoulder, he looks visibly annoyed, jealous, and maybe a bit insecure about having another man on the ship. Whilst there hasn't been any other male rival in the Milano or the Benatar, it's assured that Quill's and Gamora's relationship officially started during Guardians 2, with hints of relationship sprinkled in both films. You'd think going through several universe-saving scenarios that they can trust each other, but Gamora can't be trusted around other men? If so, that's one hell of a toxic relationship. But Quill has always had insecurities. It comes from his relationship issues with Mum and Dad. Oh really? Show your workings. Relationship issues, sure, but insecurities? Yeah, but it was funny though. The thing is, I can see the arguments for the reason against it, but I think it just boils down to the humour. We aren't the first to make this observation, and we certainly won't be the last. Obviously you can't have a Marvel film with no humour in it. How could you take a talking raccoon anything but seriously? Remember, this isn't a DC film. It's owned by the House of Mouse, and they want their projects light-hearted and funny. <laughs> Some humour lands, like Ragnarok, but others don't, like Bad Exchange. Equally, this scene shows no real remorse or care for the fact that Thor said Thanos wiped out Xandar. You know, that planet they fought so hard to protect in the first one? Sure, we see his surprise, but considering that's where they first all met each other, and saved countless lives defending it from Ronan, they would at least say something, surely. Maybe like, Xander, no, Xander, I, I can't believe Xander's gone, no, all the life lost, no, what about the funny eyebrow man, no, not John C. Riley, no! What about the scene? What scene? You know, the one. Oh, that scene. There's a lot to be said about this scene in particular. About how if star -Lord held back from hitting Thanos, there wouldn't have been an endgame. Yeah, and whilst it was a stupid decision to do so, it was in character. We've seen star -Lord seemingly act on pure emotion before, like the time he shot Ego without a second thought. So star -Lord hit in Thanos isn't completely out of character. But my time has come, my work here is done, and you will be visited by one final ghost, the ghost of Christmas future. <sighs> oh, thank God. It was just a dream. Think again. Where are we now? The end of Endgame. Thanos is defeated, turned into dust, and here we are with Guardians of the Galaxy on the ship. And your issue is? Throughout the two Guardians films, it is made clear that of Star-Lord's force around Earth. It's clear he has quite a deep attachment to it. Sure, he references Earth's culture, and ultimately Earth reminds him of his mother's death. This has been said a few times. So then, why don't we see this? We do, we see him on the ship ready to leave. So, no line of dialogue, no visible discomfort, no signs of desperation or depression or eagerness to leave. He looks down in this scene, but that's just because he's worried for Gamora. You'd think if you essentially visited your planet where your mum's grave is, you'd at least show some sort of reaction, either spoken or shown, but nothing? The Guardians have been standalone films in the MCU, never touching the arrival of Earth, so when the opportunity presents itself, you're showing nothing? Yeah, it may get touched on in the next Guardians, but that would seem like an afterthought. Damage control to repair what's broken. Instead, we get some banter with Star-Lord and Thor about his insecurities about who's a leader, which, while annoying in the first part, makes less sense as Gamora isn't there to be impressed by Thor. There's no progress. But, you're missing the point, he's insecure about not being the leader. I grant you that the MCU sometimes misses the mark and totally misunderstands the situation, but I don't think it's as big as a sin as you'd make it out to be. I get that point fully, and while it is a funny scene, it somewhat undermines him. Look over there, Star Lord meeting Gamora, who he thinks is dead, and getting kneed in the balls. Well, it sure is a bit of slapstick humour, but then again, Marvel's known for that. But doesn't that feel off? I get this Gamora doesn't know Quill as she's never met him, but whereas you have other of scenes of characters meeting in, up in the battlefield and having heartfelt reunions only for Star-Lord to be kicked in his Infinity Stones feels a bit out of place, more of a jab than anything. 
It's a bit of comedic relief in an otherwise bleak finale. So you're telling me that no other characters on the battlefield can have a funny or witty banter that doesn't involve insulting or knocking anyone down? You're telling me Drax doesn't find the sight of wizards or seeing jolly green giants amusing? But because of it, that Star-Lord over there doesn't feel like the same Star-Lord in the first or second Guardians. Character growth I understand, but if this feels like an unnecessary step backwards, he may not be an Iron Man or a Captain America, he's not heroic and he's selfish at times, but what he is, is human. Something I think Joe and Anthony Russo forgot and made him to be a punching bag. He's a caricature of himself. Question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if preserved in, they must lead. But if the courses are departed from, then the ends will change. I mean, maybe. James Gunn and Taika Waititi can improve Star-Lord in later appearances, but Russo's, while brilliant, did nothing, and ultimately hurt Star-Lord's character. What can we do to fix that? Wake up. My man, what day is it? Filming day. I'll be down in a moment. Get your shit together, let's go. You ready? Ready? Right, sync clap. Three, two, one. <coughs> Fuck the sync clap. Right, you ready? Totally. Three, two, one. It's amazing how less than 10 years ago, no one really knew who Peter Quill, Star-Lord, or any of the Guardians of the Galaxy were. James Gunn helped to redefine the Guardians and make them a household name. Both Guardians of the Galaxy films and